Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ronald Coleman and Anne Harding in The Keys of the Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, once again it's our pleasure to introduce our producer, Mr. William Keeley. For the past three years, Colonel Keeley has been chief of the motion picture division of the Army Air Forces. Prior to that, his 22 years in the theater, 12 as an actor and 10 as director, raised him to the first rank of motion picture directors, with more than 20 screen hits to his credit. We are happy to have the benefit of his experience in producing talent in this theater. Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Humility, as the proverb goes, may often be a path to fame. Some years ago, an obscure priest working in the interior of China with an humble people inspired A.J. Cronin's masterpiece, The Keys of the Kingdom. An almost instantaneous bestseller, it was brought to the screen by 20th Century Fox and is our drama on this stage tonight. For the profound and moving role of Father Chisholm, we are fortunate in having an actor who in 23 years of motion picture stardom has created many of the screen's outstanding roles, Ronald Coleman, and co-starred with him the talented and lovely Miss Anne Harding. Most of our story takes place in the interior of China, which I visited in 1939 and again during the war. It's a wild and undeveloped territory with very few of the luxuries of life. Strolling along a dimly lighted street in Kunming one evening, I was amazed to see several of those friendly cakes of Lux soap in a store window. The price? A little under a dollar and a half a cake. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, a dollar and a half a cake. It is such incidents that make you appreciate the little everyday luxuries we take so much for granted, like a clean white cake of Lux soap. They become mighty precious and important when you have to get along without them. And now, here's the first act of The Keys of the Kingdom, starring Ronald Coleman as Francis Chisholm and Anne Harding as Mother Maria Veronica. It's a September evening in 1938 in the little town of Tynecastle, Scotland. In the parlor of the parish house of St. Columbus Church, a visiting dignitary, Monsignor Tarrant, speaks to an old man. Uh, let me see, Father Chisholm. It was your wish when you returned from China to come back here to your native parish, wasn't it? Uh, this was also the native parish of His Grace, the Bishop. I'm aware that Bishop Mealy was born here. But life has treated you two somewhat differently, eh? To be brief, the bishop and I both feel that your long years of service should be recompensed, that uh, you should retire. Retire? But I have no wish to retire. There are peculiarities in the administration of this parish which his grace can scarcely overlook. Your approach to certain points of doctrine. Still peculiar, after so many years. For example, you made a statement last week. All atheists are not godless men, you said. I know of one who I hope now may be in heaven. But he was an unusual atheist. And then, the good Christian is a good man, but the Confucianist generally has a better sense of humor. Mm, yes, I did say that. And then Mrs. Tyler, who cannot help her extreme stoutness, came to you for guidance. You said, eat less. The gates of paradise are narrow. Oh, yes, Father. I'm afraid you've lost your command of soul. But I have no wish to command anyone's soul. Mm. Well, now, if you don't mind, I will go to my room. Oh, uh, I'll be leaving here early in the morning. Uh, Monsignor, when you see Angus, uh, his grace, would you be good enough to remind him that we, uh, we were boys together? The bishop has not forgotten. I shouldn't like to leave here. If it could be helped, I shouldn't. I was annoyed beyond reason that Father Chisholm, after all these years, 
still should succeed so completely in irritating me. It was impossible to sleep. There was a dusty shelf of books in my room, and a battered, plain-covered binding caught my eye. I opened it and read the words, Francis Chisholm, His Journal. I thumbed through, quite disinterestedly, till I came upon a chapter titled Holywell. <laughs> this might well interest me, for it was at Holywell College that I had first met Francis Chisholm. It was during his last year that I had occasion again to report him to Father McNair. What explanation this time? Uh, I've done something wrong, Father. Something unforgivable. I've forgotten what it was exactly, but <laughs> Francis, I'm afraid you have a genius for being misunderstood. Yes, Father. Uh, tell me, have you done any fishing lately? Uh, no, sir, but I'd like to try the Glebe Pool. There's a big trout in there. There's nothing in the Glebe Pool. Oh, yes, there's a big one now. I saw him. Uh, Father McNabb, you need me in the matter of Francis Chisholm. No, not now. You may go. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes, Father. I've done nothing but annoy Brother Tarrant ever since I enrolled here. It's me, Father. Must be my manner, my approach to things. I don't know. Francis, isn't it time you made up your mind about the future? I think of it all the time. Why did you ever come to Hollywood? Oh, it was my Aunt Polly, I suppose. She wants you to become a priest. Uh, she thinks it's my vocation. By no means do I recommend priesthood for all our students. But you, Francis, yes. I think your Aunt Polly is right. You would make a good priest. You're confused now, aren't you? Oh, it's just that I know there's a vocation for me, Father, but I don't know where to find it. I'm by far the oldest student here, but and certainly the worst. And my aunt, well, I can't go on letting her support me. There is also a girl, isn't there, Francis? Yes. Do you, do you want to tell me about her? Oh, there's not much to tell, sir, except... Last fall, when we said goodbye, she said I'd never come back to her. She was so sure that I would become a priest. I told her there wasn't much chance of that, and that I loved her. But she seemed so frightened and so terribly alone. Well, I haven't heard from her in months. I, I can't explain it. Then don't try, Francis. Just try to let God Almighty have his way. Well, now, you say you actually saw that trout in the glee pool. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, I did. There are rods and gear in the closet there. Fetch them out, Francis. Fetch them out. Ah, what a wonderful fish is a trout, Francis. <laughs> oh, it was fine of the Lord, I think, to put all the little fishes in the brooks and to send me here to catch them. Listen. It's a lonely sound, that. When I was a homesick lad, I'd imagine it was the cry of a lost soul speeding through eternity. To me, it's the Southern Express, the only thing I have of home. It whistles for me now, and tomorrow it will whistle for them in Tynecastle. Oh, Father, I want to go home. I've something to tell you, Francis, and uh, it isn't easy to tell. This girl back there, she quarreled with you, didn't she? Yes. Because she thought you were being made into a priest in spite of yourself. Oh, but I told Nora. I told her. Francis, Nora changed a good deal after you left. And all to the bad, I'm afraid. Your friend Willie Tullock has just written to me. But why to you? Father, what's happened? Nora went off with a man. They were married. And then he deserted her. A baby was born last week. Father. She's desperately ill, but her express wish that you were not to be sent for. But I... Francis, I cannot tell you to do anything except what is in your own heart to do. If you want to catch that train, you still have time. Oh, thank you. And goodbye, Father. God bless you, lad. I turned the page in Francis Chisholm's journal. There was a brief and simple entry. When I got off the train at Time Castle, I went directly to Willie Tullock. He told me... Nora had died during the night. And then came a new heading. The church, it said. And below, it would be pleasurable to record that I became an immediate success as a priest. But after five years, I remained a dismal failure. One day, a summons came from the new bishop. The new bishop and my guardian angel of old, Hamish McNair. It 
does my old eyes good to see a priest so manifestly unprosperous as you? <laughs> I walked most of the way here in the rain, Your Lordship. I'm afraid I'm a little wet. Too rebellious even to use an umbrella, eh? <laughs> I'll get you something warm. I ought to ring for some of the fine vintages used by all the bishops one reads about. <laughs> but this, well, this is only whiskey. But then we're only Scotsmen, aren't we? Oh, don't look so scared, Francis. Sit down. Thank you. You've had a pretty thin time of it, haven't you? Oh, failure might be closer to the facts, Your Lordship. At your curacy at Shalesley, you insisted upon establishing a dance hall. It was a recreation centre, Your Lordship. There was a desperate need. At any rate, there was a serious disagreement. You were then transferred to Tyne Castle. There, your closest association was with an atheist. Willie Tullock. Well, he's a doctor now. He's one of the kindest men I've ever known. Atheists have reason to be kind. Then Father Tarrant. He found you guilty of unorthodox doctrine. Yes, yes, nothing I did seemed pleasing to him. Just to Almighty God, eh? <laughs> well, certainly he can't be too pleased with me. I've failed so miserably. To me, you've never been a failure. Well, your Lordship. But don't ask me why. I'm sure I couldn't say. Perhaps it's because... I've always been partial to the stray cat who comes talking down the aisle when everyone is yawning their heads off at a dull sermon. <laughs> you like that stray cat, Francis? I haven't been able to take my eyes off you. And I can't help thinking that you're in the church not by chance, but for a reason. Francis, I'd like you to do something for me. You've always made it impossible for me to say anything but yes, Your Lordship. This will call for great sacrifice. It will mean training in language and customs. It will not be an easy life, nor a safe one, but I believe it is a life for you. I've been asked to supply a volunteer missionary for China. China? It will mean leaving far behind you your home, your friends. And Judy. Judy? Oh, yes, Nora's little girl. She means a great deal to me. Oh, yes, I remember. But, uh... I'll be happy to go, Your Lordship. I knew you would. And you'll be a great credit to both of us. Come to see me again before you leave. We'll pray for you. Oh, here. Take this with you. What? what your umbrella? Oh, no. You, you, as long as I can remember. Even when we went fishing. Take you, it. You... It's a good thing to have. You never know when it's going to <laughs> rain. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. In his journal, Francis Chisholm described his mission as near the river city of Pai Town, far inland. He arrived by boat. Two Chinese were waiting for him, a man and a woman. I'm Hosanna Wong, Father, your beloved catechist, and this is my Christian wife, Philomena. How do you do? We have Paris and a sedan chair, if Father is ready. Well, how nice. But it's such a lovely day, I'd rather walk to the mission. I will tear the barrels to uh, bring the baggage. Uh, thank you, Hosanna. Well, shall we go? We stop here, Father. Oh, but I'm not tired, really. But there is the mission, see? There? What is that, that pile of ruins? Uh, the roof is gone, and but the two walls remain standing. Well, what happened? Tell me. The good father who preceded you placed it too near the river, and the devil sent a wicked flood. But the congregation, have they done nothing to rebuild it? Father must realize that for one year now, we get no money. You mean you, you were given money? Why? To buy rice, Father. How else could we get new converts for the church? As soon as our father restores our rightful wages, he will find us as useful as ever. And for the same price, we also serve the mass. Well, I want you to know now that I can't pay you any money. Uh, and I should also warn you that I understand almost everything you say. And I know what rice Christians are. I have no interest in them, whatever. <laughs> Perhaps Father needs to understand more than the language. There is much animosity here against... Uh, Foreigners. Yes, well, thank you for the warning, but I've come a long distance to reach here, and here I'll stay, with your help or without it. Ah, it's unfortunate, Father. Most unfortunate. With 
his meager funds, he rented a small room in the city and hung out a sign. The natives were not long in coming to his chapel. Only a few at first, but with mud and rotten vegetables. Then in greater number, with rocks and clubs. Even now, as I write to you, dear Bishop McNabb, the storm outside this little chapel, clamoring for my eyes to blacken and my bones to break. I have no personal fear of them, but, but my spirit droops with my inability to find a way to carry God's grace to these unhappy creatures. If I do not find the way, it will be only because I have failed again. But I can promise your lordship that I will search for it until the end of my day. I have lived thus far in failure. If I am to die in it, I want it to be here where only God and I will know. In just a moment, we'll bring you the second act of the Keys of the Kingdom. We have a rather unusual guest tonight, a former carpenter's helper and ship's joiner who weighs about 115 pounds, has a lovely shoulder-length bob, and what's more, is beautiful. Well, I wish you could see Miss Joyce Elaine McKenzie, young international picture starlet, from shipyard to screen career in a few short years. Correct, Joyce? Yes, Mr. Keeley. And now suppose you tell us how you did it. Well, I came to San Francisco to do war work and got a job in the shipyards there. Then I came to the Pasadena Playhouse to study drama. And one of my apprentice tasks was to sell tickets at the box office. And that's how I was seen by a Hollywood talent scout. And he offered you a screen test? Yes, but as it turned out, I never made one. I got a contract after my first interview with International's general manager. The contract included three months of dramatic training and a part in the new picture, Tomorrow is Forever. It just shows what talent, work, and beauty can do. And when it comes to beauty, I'm going to consult our complexion connoisseur here, John Kennedy. We all know how important a lovely, smooth complexion is to camera close-ups. Miss McKenzie, with a complexion like yours, I can understand why the studio took you without even a screen test. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I do know what daily Lux soap care can do for the skin. It's a wonderful beauty aid, Mr. Kennedy. In Tomorrow's Forever, Claudette Colbert is a star, and I know that she always depends on Lux facials, too. Thanks for that Hollywood beauty tip, Miss Joyce McKenzie. It's true that nine out of ten screen stars and hundreds of lovely young starlets find daily care with gentle Lux toilet soap really works. You see, Lux is a real beauty product made only of the finest ingredients. You'll find this satin smooth toilet soap is ripe for delicate skin. Try it for your own precious complexion tomorrow. Here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act Two of The Keys of the Kingdom, starring Ronald Coleman as Father Chisholm and Anne Harding as Mother Maria Veronica. In the bedroom of his little parish house, Father Chisholm lies awake, clutched by the worries of his compulsory retirement. But in another room, a lamp burns deep into the night, and the years fall away from Father Chisholm as Monsignor Tarrant reads the pages of the old priest's journal. He learns now of China and of the coming of Father Chisholm's first parishioner, a youth named Joseph. But why have you come, Joseph? Because you are here. I have been working five days and four nights. Uh, Joseph, I can't pay you any money. I have not asked for money. I wish to serve because the mission must be rebuilt, and I am a Christian. Oh. Can you forgive me? Here, I have brought several, several dozen of eggs, which I have gathered along the way. Eggs? <laughs> Growing like wildflowers? They were alone with no one to care for them. <laughs> I could not forsake them. Joseph, you have a fine missionary instinct, but I must teach you not to apply it to other people's property. I have brought some tea also. Would Father will come a cup? A cup of tea. And I have so little I can share with you. Father can share with me his privilege to work for God. Father, Father, what is it? 
Where would such a big box come from? From Scotland, Joseph. Scotland. What does it contain? Medicines and bandages. And look, surgical instruments. Who sends these great things, Father? <laughs> ah, my friend, Willie Tullock. Here. Look, he's enclosed a letter. Listen. Dear Francie, it's amazing how religious you can make a man feel by fixing his belly. I am sending you all my secrets and a book of instructions. Cure what you can and kill what you can't. Willie Tullock, M.D. and Heathen. <laughs> P.S. For practicing without a license, I shall report you to the medical society, your bishop and my Chinese laundryman. Father, <laughs> there is a use for the boards of this packing bag. Uh, what's that? A new sign for our mission, public dispensary. Excellent. Sick, treated here, free. Well, come on now, let's get these things inside. <laughs> Willie. Five weeks, Father, you have been studying the book of medicine and still no converts. Not even a patient. Perhaps you could pretend to cure me of a broken leg. I could go down to the city and advertise no, it. No, 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 Joseph. But if I really broke my leg, listen. What? Someone approaches. You drag him in, Father, and I'll sit upon him. Now, Joseph, quiet. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm here at the bidding of my cousin. Mr. Powell. My cousin is the Mandarin, Mr. Chia. His only son, Chia Yu, lies sick unto death. Oh, I'm sorry. In playing, the boy scratched his arm. As a consequence, the lower humors have gained in ascendancy, distending the arm and making it blue. Has he been treated? Three physicians and a Tao priest are in constant attendance. Well, I'm not a physician. I, I treat only the most simple disturbances. My cousin asks only that you do whatever good you can. Oh, yes, I'll come. I have chair bearers awaiting outside. Father, Mr. Chia is a mandarin. If the boy should die... Uh, then... Joseph, uh, you don't think you can frighten me, do you? No, Father. Well, then I you're, do not. You're mistaken. But I must go, so, so start praying to St. Andrew and don't stop praying till I get back. Here on the bed is Chia Yu. Who are those men in the corner? The physicians and the priests. Oh. They will not leave the room. If you insist... Oh, no, no, be... no, I don't insist, no. Let me see the boy's arm. Will I you? will draw back the cover. What is this that you do? Well, I have to clean the area with alcohol. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Chia Yu. The pad in the jar. Quickly. This is the sleeping water? Yes. Place the pad over his face. Now, slowly. Drop by drop. He will feel nothing? Oh, no, nothing. A little more. More. Now, now, the lancet. What is it you do now? It's necessary to cut the boy's arm. <laughs> Holy St. Andrew, help me. I implore you, help me. All right, stand aside, Mr. Powell. <laughs> windows. I'm finished. The boy will live? I don't know. It was most unexpected that you would cut with a knife into the flesh of the boy. That arm was filled with corruption. Let us hope that corruption can be removed by cutting. Let us hope that everything will be well. I told you at the mission I'm not a... I'll be back in the morning. Well, look, Mr. Powell. Why, the boy is smiling. Good morning, Chia Yu. That is all you do now? Change the bandages? Yes, that's all. Of course, we can't be certain, but there seems little to worry about. My cousin, Mr. Chia, says it will not be necessary to come again. Oh, but it's no trouble. Nothing more is required. Good day. Good day, Mr. Powell. Dear Lord, give me patience and humility. It was thy merciful goodness that saved the boy. This is an ungrateful house, and you know it. A 
Come in. You are the Christian priest? Yes. I am Mr. Chia, my son whose life you saved is well. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. So I have come here to be made a Christian. Father, this is a miracle. You believe in Christianity? I will accustom myself to it. No, Christianity is not a habit, Mr. Chia. But you have done the greatest good for me. I must now do the greatest good for you. As I accept your Christian belief, so will follow all of Paitan. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, you wouldn't be doing any good for me. You do not believe, nor do you desire to believe. You reject me? Hmm. You owe me nothing, Mr. Chia. I regret I am not acceptable. Father, you are turning down a mandarin. I see no difference between buying a man's soul and taking it in exchange for services rendered. Would you step outside here just a moment, please? Have you ever looked upon yonder hill? Oh, many times. This is the most beautiful part of the countryside. The property is large, and it is mine. I beg you to honor me by accepting it for your church. Mr. Cheer. I beg further that you accept the use of my working men and the materials for any building that you may wish to erect. Are you serious? If I were not, I would be unworthy to look upon my son as his father. The legal papers will be delivered tomorrow. My soul doth magnify the Lord, for he that is mighty hath done great things to me, and mighty is his name. Two years later, Francis Chisholm at long last had a new mission and a flourishing congregation. Eagerly, he was awaiting the arrival of the sisters for the mission school. On the day they came, they saw a man in ragged work clothes stooped over a trough of cement. Take us to Father Chisholm, please. I am Mother Maria Veronica. Oh, but, but you weren't expected until tomorrow. Are we to trudge back to that miserable ship? Uh, no, I, I, uh, you see, uh, I am Father Chisholm. You are... Yeah, please understand. The letter I had from Angus, uh, from Monsignor Mealy, said distinctly that, uh, uh, that you I were... May I present my companions? Sister Martha, Sister Clotilde... Uh, how do you do? Father Chisholm. I can't tell you how sorry uh, I will am. Will Father that... have us shown to our quarters? The sisters are sadly in need of rest. Yes, if you, if you follow me, please. <laughs> Good evening, Reverend Mother. Good evening, Father. I came here to the schoolroom to write a letter. I've been hoping that you'll also find time to assist me in the dispensary. If you will let me know the hours, I shall be there. Of course, I haven't much medical knowledge, but uh, we... That's a beautiful photograph in your writing case. Yes, Miss Castle. It is in Austria. Austria? Is it near your home? It um, is quite near. How different it must be from my home. Oh, I, I don't mean just geographically, but, but the idea of a ruling class, of a rigid discrimination between an aristocracy oh, Father Chisholm, and the... I'm sure you understand how earnestly Sisters Clotilde and Martha and I desire to work for this mission. At the same time, I, I trust you will afford us a certain freedom of action. Freedom of... Uh, we should like to maintain a separate establishment. Oh, nothing else was ever intended. Your little house will be your convent. And you will permit me to manage our convent affairs. By all means. Only uh, uh, be careful about money, won't you? We are very poor. Uh, we shall not require financial assistance. Uh, no. Well, doesn't your order enforce holy poverty? Holy poverty, Father, does not require me to beg. Uh, but, uh, yes, I'll send you a note of the dispensary hours. Uh, good evening, Reverend Mother. I have told you, dear brother, of my first meetings with our peasant priest, dripping with good fellowship and careful of his manner. He's just been in to see me again. He saw the photograph of the castle, but I didn't tell him it's our home. Of course, I know that every word I write is a sin against God, but I cannot help myself. Oh, I dread the future. Shut up in this isolated spot serving certainly the lowliest of God's kingdom, 
and dedicated to the belief in their equality with me before God. Well, I wanted to have it so, and I have it so. Are you in the garden, Reverend Mother? Yes, Sister Martha. The couple you hired have arrived, Hosanna and his wife. Oh, Father Pitt. Excuse me, Sister. Uh, Reverend Mother, about Hosanna and Philomena. Yes? Uh, I've had dealings with them before. They are far from reliable. With Christian charity, Father? Yeah, but I would fail in my responsibility toward the mission and you if I were to... Well, a month ago you said I might manage our house. Father, Father. Yes, Joseph? Uh, Father, there is a man to see you. He said to tell you he's the devil's number one boy. Joseph. No, it can't be. It couldn't be. Willie. Willie Dallas. Francie. Francie, my boy. You see? Up top the devil. I've been very patient, Willie. I've shown you the mission, let you eat your dinner in peace, but I can't wait a minute longer now. Whatever brings you here? Well, in almost 40 years, Francie, one gets to see all there is in Time Castle. <laughs> so one day I wandered over a hill, but always there was another hill, and here I am in your sacred presence. Now tell me, uh, Nora's little girl, Judy, is she all right? There's a strange lass, Francie, like her mother, moody and unpredictable. Well, she'll marry one day and maybe find happiness. Happiness, huh? What about you? I've given the world thousands of aspirin tablets and acquired a taste for Irish whiskey. And I'll thank you not to use my maudlin self-pity as an argument to prove the existence of a soul. <laughs> now, why should I try and argue you into something you already believe? Why should I... Joseph. Yes, Father? That black eye, where did you get that? Forgive me, Father, but two hours ago I found it necessary to give Busan a beating. Oh, now, Joseph. Also, his wife. Equal rights for women, I agree. They were, they were saying that Mother Maria Veronica is a great lady and that you are simply dust. Uh, Joseph, we are all dust. I am not blessed with your tolerance, Father. No, then I must punish you. You may, you may have that new robe you've been wanting. New robe? Father, would you like me to beat them again? Now, Joseph, no. That's enough. Oh... I have a message from the sisters, Father. They would like to see you on the porch of their house immediately. <laughs> Thank you for telling me immediately. Uh, excuse me, Willie. Father Kisholm. Oh, those hypocrites. Those low-lying thieves. Uh, who? Hosanna Wing and Philomena. They've gone with our money and our silver. And Sister Martha's ivory crucifix. They could have murdered us. But they didn't, Sister Clotilde. Has Reverend Mother been told? Yes, Father. Sister Martha, it was my fault that your crucifix was stolen. I know how dear it was to you. Please accept this one in its place. It is not ivory, but it has always been one of the most precious possessions of my family and myself. Good night. Good night, Father. Good night. Good night. Good night, Father. Good evening. Why, Mr. Cheer. I have come in haste to say farewell. I am taking my family to the mountains. Come with us, Father. Well, thank you, but I can't leave the mission. Even if there is great danger? Danger? There are troops in Pai Tan, the soldiers of the new Chinese Republic. Well, yes, I know. What you may not know is the Imperial troops under General Wei moved into these hills today. And what will happen? General Wei will bombard the city. Oh. I am surprised it has not already started. Unfortunately, your mission is directly in the middle. But uh, our, our neutrality will be respected. It is a pleasant assumption. Goodbye, my friend. It has started. Help yourself well. Brother, the fields are landing in the city. Look, already there are many fires. Right, welcome for me, Francie. Now, Willie, I've, I've got to go down there. Why? What makes you think you're wanted? Oh, I don't pretend that I'm wanted anywhere. But God's mercy is everywhere, and you can't quarantine it within the mission. Wait a minute. I've come 6,000 miles to see you, and you're not going to get away from me now. I'm going, too. Oh, thank you, good old lady. For days, the bombardment of Pai Tan continued. And for days, Francis and Willie Tullock remained where a major of the Republican Army had helped them set up what they chose to call a hospital. I'm not ungrateful, Father Chisholm. 
But I fail to see the logic of bringing dying people back to life only so General Way can kill them with his cannon. Is it that hopeless, Major? True, they have only the one cannon, but we have none at all. And every night their patrols move closer. We will be inevitably massacred. And what do you suggest? Nothing. If we are both alive, I shall see you in the morning. Trump, if you've had no sleep in a week, why don't you leave today's collections to the Major and me? Go up on the hill and get yourself a bath and 400 winks. They'll let you through, won't they? Mm, probably. And that'd be a pretty sight, wouldn't it? A man of God safely taking his ease. <laughs> Father! Father! Well, what are you doing here, Joseph? Uh, last night we fired on the mission. Our beautiful church is destroyed. Oh. Was anyone hurt? Some of the men, when we tried to save the altar pieces. Uh, it looks like I'm going up the hill after all, Willie. Not alone, you're not. Stay here, Joseph. Tell the Major we'll be back. <laughs> seen us, Francie. They're trying to pin us down. We'll be safe enough once we get beyond this bridge. Keep your head down. Willie, Willie, look. There in the gully. Aren't those wounded men? I've been hoping you wouldn't notice. But we can't leave them, Willie. Uh, stay here. I'll do a bit of reconnoitering. Yes, you're not going after them alone. I just want to see if... Willie! Willie! Leave me alone, Francie. Leave me alone. Francie, where am I? At the mission, Willie. We got you through. <laughs> You've been praying. I have. Yeah, you're wasting your time. The <laughs> Almighty's too. I'm deep in the valley, Francie. But I still can't believe in God. Are you mad at me? Oh, Willie, Willie, your salvation will be your doing, not mine. Francie. I've never loved you as much as I do now. You haven't tried to bully me into heaven. I've such an awful headache. Give me your hand, Francie. Willie, your hand. Father. Father to them. Reverend Mother. Forgive me. But I've been watching you. Sitting here in the ruins of your church. Uh, Dr. Tullock? He's dead. May he now have peace. Father, you should know that I am responsible for the shelling of the church. Yesterday, wounded soldiers from the city made their way here. I let them in. I would have done the same. It must be a great blow to you. Your beautiful church so wantonly destroyed. No one can destroy my church. I shall build it again. As long as I live, I shall build my church. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Before we bring you the third act of The Keys of the Kingdom, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. With a mathematical question for you, Mr. Keeley, what's just twice as glamorous as one gorgeous blonde? Well, the only possible answer to that one is two gorgeous blondes. <laughs> right the first time, Mr. Keeley. And the two blondes I'm thinking of are Betty Grable and June Haver. The Dolly sisters. Mm-hmm. They star together in the new 20th Century Fox musical of that famous pair. And they make a wonderful team. Oh, yes. With Betty Grable and June Haver singing and dancing as the Dolly sisters did a generation ago. And the costumes they wear are truly magnificent in Technicolor. There's a dazzling white set in the picture, for instance, with both girls gowned in white. It certainly sets off their blue eyes and blonde hair. And say, Libby, what about those two famous Lux complexions? Why, Mr. Kennedy, they deserve very special mention. Both Betty Grable and June Haver have the same peaches and cream look. I happen to know they never neglect their daily active lather facials. What a recommendation for Lux Soap Care, when two such radiant stars depend on it. 
You know, I wish every woman who wants a real beauty care would discover for herself how effective these facials can be. Well, Libby, why not tell the ladies how easy it is to take these Hollywood beauty facials? Well, here's all there is to it. First, cover your face with a creamy active lather and work it well in. Rinse with warm water and splash on cold, and then pat to dry with a soft towel. These daily Lux Soap beauty facials do make skin softer, smoother. Recent tests showed actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time. Why not try Lux Toilet Soap Care regularly for a while? See if it doesn't give your skin fresh new beauty that will delight you. Remember, Gentle White Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's own beauty soap. Mr. William Keeley returns to the microphone. Act Three of Keys of the Kingdom, starring Ronald Coleman as Father Chisholm and Anne Harding as Mother Maria Veronica. <laughs> Two days after the destruction of the mission, Father Chisholm made a sudden journey back to the beleaguered city of Paitan, the headquarters of Major Wu. Forgive me, Father, but you are a fool. Why do you return to this death trap? To learn something. Major, if General Wei were deprived of his cannon, what would our chances be? We would live instead of die. Well, there's a way to destroy the gun. What? I had a visitor this morning, one of General Wei's captains. I've been ordered to bring him money and all our canned food. If you do not, everyone at the mission will be shot. Uh, the, the, the captain, whom I am to see, commands the gun positions. My friend, you are an undeserved gift from heaven. Yes, I'm afraid I'll have to forget about heaven tonight. Good. Then concentrate on what I'm about to propose. Sentries will be stopping us soon, Major. Therefore, let us review what is to happen. We've been over it a dozen times. For the thirteenth time, then, in this sack, along with the cans of food, is gasoline and a bundle of cordite. Yes, and I will set the sack on the ground next to the cannon. Exactly. When I fire into the gasoline, it will ignite and explode the cordite. Yeah. And my troops, now on the trail behind us, will attack successfully. That's all there is to it. Oh, let us hope so. A light new torch now. And for the love of your Lord and my perishable body, keep it away from the sack. Hey, how is them? You brought what I ordered? A sack full of goods, Captain, which I hope will impress you. Put it down. Yes, Captain. <clears throat> By your cannon here. But where is the money? I must have your promise first that our people will not be harmed. Give me the money. Give him nothing, Father. Here go, that's it. Run, Father, and save yourself! Father, do you hear me? Can you talk, Father? Am I at the mission? Yes, Father. Your leg, it was badly hurt. Yes, but the, the cannon... Uh, the cannon no longer exists. Ah. No, does the enemy. Never have I seen such a lovely killing. One more like that, and you will force me to endure Christianity. Dear Lord, forgive me for what I have done this night. Forgive me. Four months later, Father Chisholm saw another old friend from Tanka. Angus Mealy, Monsignor Mealy, who had come to China on an inspection tour of the mission. I just can't hide my disappointment, Francis. I had set my heart on celebrating high mass in your church, and look at it, ruin complete. Well, your disappointment is no greater than ours, Angus. Oh, if only Reverend Mother hadn't antagonized that wretched general way. Well, we've had our difficulties at home, too. Reorganization after Bishop McNabb's death and the change. Oh, no. Weren't you told? Yes, he died in March. A very old man, of course. Muddled and past his best. He was very good to me. Well, we must take things as they are and face them. Now that I'm here, Francis, I'll do my best to... Uh... Francis, I don't believe you're listening. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I seem to be depressing you quite thoroughly. Well, tonight we can entertain Reverend Mother and have a real round table conference. Well, Reverend Mother never leaves the sister's house after the dinner hour. Oh, nonsense. You just haven't asked her properly. She'll come all right. Uh, another cup of tea, Reverend Mother? No, thank you, Monsignor. Mm, it's been a fine dinner. Mm, splendid. 
We were talking about China. Yes, your record's been truly remarkable, Angus. All those new omissions. And all flourishing. But, uh, unfortunately, they put quite a drain on our finances. I'm afraid we can't let you have the money to rebuild your church. Ah, if only your rich friend, Mr. Chia, had seen the light. Well, he hasn't. And still, he's given most generously. I'm not going to ask him for more. Well, that's your own affair. But I must tell you, Francis, that on our charts, your convert rate is the very lowest. Yes, I suppose missionaries differ in their abilities. Oh, it's, it's just the way you do things, living in such poor style, eating in the kitchen. You ought to make more of a show. But the Chinese hate that kind of ostentation, and priests who practice it are regarded as dishonorable. You refer to their own low heathen priests? No, heathens aren't always low, just as Christians are not always high. Many of their priests are good and noble men. Well, have it your own way. Oh, uh, Reverend Mother, you, you're going? I'm afraid I must. Uh, may I escort you to your house? Uh, there may be problems you'd like to discuss away from Father Chisholm. Father Chisholm is aware of all my problems. Well, uh, in that case, uh, we shall discuss your distinguished brother, the Baron. Excuse us, Father. Good night, Reverend Mother. Good night, Father. I'll be right back, Francis. I have been listening, Father. Please, may I say something sinful? Of course not, Joseph. Oh, you will hear it in confession anyway. Father, I shall be extremely delighted when Monsignor says goodbye tomorrow. <laughs> Monsignor paid us such a short visit, Reverend Mother, and I'd hoped so much that we might have had some talks of the old days of Tyne Castle and Holywell. Father, there's something I must tell you. Last night I intended to ask Monsignor ne Neely to send me away. Send you? Let me say it, Father. From our first meeting, I behaved shamefully and sinfully towards you. Oh, no. I no. want you to know that I am most bitterly sorry. Believe me, no apology was ever more abject than mine. Nor has anyone been less worthy of forgiveness. Oh, you need Please. I was born into arrogance, Father, and taught contempt for those who were not. How could I hope to live by the word of God, which is for all men? But you have. From the and beginning, you... I knew that yours was the true humility, that mine was a duty. I resented your deep and honest compassion. But as I heard the Monsignor humble and slight you as as I felt the magnificence of your faith and, and the courage of your heart. I, oh, forgive me, Father. Forgive me and, and pity me. There's nothing for which I have to forgive you. We're all children to God, and with his help, we'll work and mature. And I, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad you no longer dislike me. <laughs> The journal describes the next ten years as fruitful, peaceful, and unnoticed in their going, as passing years should go. Father Chisholm had rebuilt his church. Two hundred faithful souls were in his congregation. And in their prayer books, not a single grain of rice. Then one day, the Reverend Mother had news for him. Father, I just heard. A Protestant mission has been established in Titan. Oh? They've rented a fine house. They plan even a hospital with a resident doctor. It sounds extremely beneficial. Well, what will you do, Father? Do? I shall put on my good suit, take my umbrella, and call upon them. Good afternoon. I am Father Chisholm. Oh, won't you come in? Thank you. Is, uh... Is Dr. Fisk at home? I certainly am, Father Chisholm. Well, I've heard a great deal about you. Oh, oh well, I don't know whether to be, uh, uh, to be happy about that or not. Well, you have a wonderful establishment here. We hope to make it one at any rate. Uh, tell me something, Father. Do you resent our coming here? Oh, now, what justification could I possibly have for such a feeling? None. But we know, don't we, Agnes? <laughs> well, you see... Once after we'd been up country all by ourselves, another missionary came. I'm afraid we did feel a Frankly, little... at the time, we didn't like his coming at all. You know, uh, sometimes I wonder how the Christian faith must appear to the Chinese mind. With all the different sects crying at the same time, come over here, this is the one, this is the true one. We've seen a great deal of it. We're all campaigners. 
And now our son is in settlement work, too. In China? In Scotland. Right now, he's at a place called Tyne Castle. Tyne Castle. Why, that's my home. Have you ever been there? Oh, yes, just last year. We met the rector of the cathedral, Monsignor Mealy. Do you know him? Angus Mealy and I were boys together. He's a splendid man. Splendid. I thought him, well, just a shade formal, would you say? No, oh, not formal. Stuffy. Did you say stuffy? Uh, decidedly stuffy. Agnes, put some tea on the fire. Father Chisholm and I are going to have a nice long visit. <laughs> I am nearing the end of the journal now. And Father Chisholm writes, How fast the years have tumbled into my lap. Too fast almost for me to tell one from another. Thirty years, forty. I am I'm reminded, reminded of, this of this everywhere, everywhere I look. And I spend my days memorizing every face, every stone, every tree of my beloved mission. For it is time for me to go home. Almost every day, Dr. Fisk calls on me. Even when he isn't here, his presence still is felt. Time for your milk now, Father. Oh, now take it away. Ah, uh, not now, Dr. Fisk ordered it. No, it's <laughs> best for you. Well, after tomorrow, I shall be free to decide for myself what I shall eat and what I shall... Oh, dear, I don't want to go. I don't want to leave here. Father, what is that book? Oh, it's just my journal. How out of proportion are events to the words with which we try to describe them. No one's ever really been able to write of pain, or love, or God, as well as we can feel them. Oh, I almost forgot. I've had a letter. Now, here's a picture of Judy's little boy, Andrew. Ah, oh, he's, he's, how do you say, a bonny lad. Yes. yes, he has that from his grandmother, from Nora. What a strange continuity of unhappiness, Reverend Mother. First Nora, then Judy, who lived and died as wretchedly as she was born. And now Andrew, deserted by his father, as was Judy, wanted by no one but me. Well, but who's been taking care of him? Oh, my aunt left a little money. I've sent what I could. Oh, yes, yes. And there was news in the letter, too, Reverend Mother. Angus Mealy is now Bishop of Tynecastle. Bishop? How much he has made of his life. And how little I've made of mine. Well, I mean no disrespect, but it's my personal opinion that you are closer to God than he. Oh, now, please, please. Now then, if you'll excuse me, there's one more item I must enter in the journal. Well, I won't annoy you. Brought my knitting, see? Tomorrow, I leave. But I prefer to say goodbye now. To Reverend Mother Maria Veronica. How shall I say goodbye to a friend with whom I've worked for so many years through revolution, famine, and poverty, and come to know so well? In weeks past, when I insisted that I didn't want to leave, she made me foolishly happy by encouraging my rebellion. And yet both of us knew my leaving was inevitable. And we would, uh, to quote the wisest man I have ever known, let Almighty God have his way. And may that Almighty God watch over her and keep her always. Oh, my dear friend, my dear friend. Almost the whole city of Pytan was at the river landing when he left with their flowers and their tears. Their gift to him was a beautiful scroll. Joseph was selected to present it. Father, it is with the utmost, the utmost anguish that we, thy children, that we, thy children, oh, it's no use, Father. What I am supposed to say, 20 times I have said it perfectly. But how can I speak to you in words I have memorized like a parrot? There is no one here who has not his own memories of you and your love 
and your goodness. Let them speak in their own hearts for themselves. And as for me, dear Father Francis, I cannot speak. I have no memories other than those of you. I have had no other life than yours. Joseph, my oldest and most loyal comrade. Uh, my good friends, will you, will you let me bless you all? Lord, let thy most benevolent blessings fall upon these thy children. And through thy grace, bring to them peace and contentment to the end of their day. An hour has passed since I closed the covers of Father Chisholm's journal. Out of the window I see the cab I ordered has arrived. And downstairs I can hear the old man shuffling about and the shouts of the little boy and... Good morning. Good morning. I hope you slept well, Monsignor. As a matter of fact, I, I didn't sleep at all. I, I read your journal. Oh, I hope you don't mind. Oh, oh I, I should imagine that the memories of a life as ineffectual as mine would, would guarantee sleep. Ineffectual? Oh. It's an honor to have known you, Father. Now, there's much I would like to say. Ah, but, but your cab is waiting. Goodbye, Monsignor. Uh, you won't forget to mention to, uh, to Angus... I mean, his grace. Oh, there is nothing I will say that will in any way alter your position here. Monsignor. This will be your home and your parish, as long as you desire. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Father. Go goodbye. Andrew. Andrew. Yes, Father. Well, don't stand there, lad, with half the morning gone. <laughs> Come now, we'll get the fishing rod. Andrew. Wasn't it just fine of the Lord to make all the rivers and fill them all with little fishes and then send you and me here to catch them? <laughs> hey, boy, hey! Our curtain falls on the keys of the kingdom. And I'm sure you'll agree that we can chalk up another highly delightful evening thanks to Ronald Coleman and Ann Harding. Oh, thank you, Bill. I enjoyed playing Father Chisholm. And being a fisherman myself, I'm very glad he ended where he did. You have fisherman, Ronnie? <laughs> I should say so. What was the biggest fish you ever caught, Ronnie? Uh, well, uh, that's rather hard to say. <laughs> yes, why? Well, uh, my wife's listening and I've forgotten what I told her. <laughs> <laughs> How are you on the land end of the fishing pole, Anne? Oh, I'm not too good, Bill. Fish always upset me so. They look very unhappy, even in the water. Well, you know what makes them unhappy, Anne? So much water and no Lux toilet soap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hence the expression, poor fish. <laughs> no, quite seriously, Bill. I wouldn't think of getting along without Lux toilet soap. It's always been my very special beauty care. And that from a very special beauty is indeed a very special compliment. Well, what are you presenting on this stage next week, Bill? Uh, next Monday night, we have a thrilling drama of the racetrack, packed with action and suspense. It's Paramount's recent screen hit, Salty or Raw? Starring in the title role that he portrayed so ably on the screen, Alan Ladd. With William Demarest and Marjorie Reynolds as the girl whom two men love and fight for. Well, sounds like an exciting evening, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Be sure to join us in the audience next Monday. Between now and next week, most of us will observe Thanksgiving Day. A very special Thanksgiving Day this year because we have so much to be grateful for. Victory and peace and the return of millions of our men. But while we count our blessings, let us also look into the future. For peace is a grave responsibility. The things that we are thankful for today, we must be vigilant guardians of tomorrow. The very greatness of our country and the power given us in victory are a sacred charge to see that never again shall the forces of greed and hatred and intolerance be loosed upon the world. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, 
Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Alan Ladd, William Demarest, and Marjorie Reynolds in Salty O'Rourke. This is William Keeley saying goodnight to you from Hollywood. In furtherance of the current victory loan drive, admission to next Monday night's Lux Radio Theater broadcast of Salty O'Rourke will be granted solely to the purchasers of victory bonds. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Salty O'Rourke with Alan Ladd, William Demarest, and Marjorie Reynolds. The Spry Treat of the Week. Spry Mince Pie, luscious, fruity mince meat in a golden nut sweet Spry crust. Clip the tested Spry recipe from November Women's Magazines. And remember, only Spry shortening gives you that tender, flaky Spry pastry. Get Spry, S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Salty O'Rourke with Alan Ladd, William Demarest, and Marjorie Reynolds. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.